Okay, now we're going to talk about chapter three, basic biomechanical factors and concepts. So what's biomechanics? So biomechanics is the study of the mechanics as it relates to the functional and anatomical analysis of biological systems. Whoa. <laughs> Necessary to study the body's mechanical characteristics and principles to understand movement, right? So this class is movement anatomy. So we need to understand biomechanics. And when you do your movement presentation, you will definitely need to know uh, levers and pulleys and first and second class levers. Um, so mechanics is the study of the physical action of forces. Um, so mechanics is divided into two, statics and dynamics. So statics, study of systems that are in a constant state of motion, whether at rest with no motion or moving at a constant velocity without acceleration. So it's a statics involves all forces acting on the body being in balance, which results in the body being in equilibrium. So here's an example of statics. This is amazing, right? Look at this guy on the edge of... Now, dynamics, study of systems in motion with acceleration. A system in acceleration is unbalanced due to unequal forces acting on the body. Make sure you know the definition of kinematics and kinetics. Kinematics is the description of motion and includes consideration of time, displacement, velocity, acceleration, and space factors of a system's motion. But kinetics is the study of forces associated with the motion of a body. Ah, look at this little thing. That's amazing, right? Now, mechanical advantage is very important to understand. Load or effort or load divided by effort. Ideally, using a relatively small force or effort to move a much greater resistance. Used to move one point of an object a relatively small distance to result in a relatively large amount of movement of another point of the same object. So here's the mechanical advantage right here. Right, so every single pulley here provides a mechanical advantage. One, two, three four and five. All right, all right, you won your bet. You can lift me with one hand, right? So, and that's obviously he couldn't lift the elephant with one hand without this mechanical advantage here. So you're looking for ways to be efficient and find mechanical advantages. And depending on where this is placed, we can, let's say he weighs 500 pounds. Sometimes each pulley can give you a mechanical advantage depending on if it's one or two. And then basically just needs a hundred pounds of torque to lift them, All right? So let's talk about that. Musculoskeletal system may be thought of as a series of simple machines. That's what it is. Machines used to increase mechanical advantage. Consider mechanical aspect of each component in analysis with respect to the component's machine-like function. Machines function in four ways. Well, they balance multiple forces. They enhance force in an attempt to reduce the total force needed to overcome a resistance. Enhance range of motion and speed of movement so that resistance may be moved farther or faster than the applied force and alter the resulting direction of the applied force. So good quiz question would be machines do all the following except, right? So make sure you know the four things that it does so you can find the exception. Arrangement of the musculoskeletal system provides three types of machines in producing movement. You've got levers, wheels, and pulleys. So levers, which are the most common, wheels or axes, and pulleys. Like I said, the human body is just levers, wheels, and pulleys. So let's look at levers first, or levers. So humans move up through a system of levers. Levers cannot be changed, but they can be utilized more efficiently. So a lever is a rigid bar that turns about an axis of rotation, or fulcrum, and the axis point of rotation about which the lever moves. So, levers rotate about the axis as a result of force or effort, E, being applied to cause its movement against a resistance that is sometimes referred to as the load or the weight. So, in the body, the bones represent the bars, the joints are the axes, and the muscles contract to apply the force. So, this is how the levers work in the body. This is a general definition of a lever, but this is how the lever would work in the body. Again, bones represent the bars. Okay, joints are the axes, and muscles contract to apply the force. So resistance can vary from max to min, 
bones themselves or the weight of the body segment may be the only resistance applied. All lever systems have each of these three components in one of three possible arrangements. Okay, so you're either a first class, second class, or third class lever. Three points determine the type of lever and application for which it is best suited. So make sure you know these three things. So A is for axis or fulcrum, the point of rotation. So axis A all mean the same thing. Point of force application, F, which is usually where the muscle inserts effort. Okay. Point of resistance application R, which is the center of gravity of lever or location of an external resistance. So let's look at the first class lever. A is the axis. Somewhere between the F and the resistance. That's the first class lever. Second class lever, resistance is somewhere between A and the force. So here's the axes, here's the resistance, and there's the force. Okay. Third class lever, force is somewhere between the axes and the resistance. So and I'll give you examples of body parts that are first class, second class, and third class. But I'll tell you right now, the second class is the most efficient. So if you see that on a quiz question, it's the most efficient because it reminds you of a wheelbarrow. Okay? So think about a wheelbarrow here. Here's the resistance. You're going to put a whole bunch of rocks in here, and then it just takes minimum effort to hold it. So the calves work this way. Okay? Think about how much effort you need to put in order to lift your 200, 300 pounds. Not much, because the calves are very efficient. So if you look at this, okay. so here's a first class lever. Okay. Here's a second class lever. And here's a third class lever. So the biceps, here's the axis, here's the effort, and there's the load. There's the effort. There's the load. That's your body weight. And there's the fulcrum. There's the fulcrum. There's the effort. And there's the load. Okay, so the first and second class levers are not very efficient. The most efficient would be the second class lever. Okay, to determine which lever is the most efficient, we have to look at the mechanical advantage. Remember I showed you the picture of the monkey and the elephant. So the, the mechanical advantage of levers may be determined using the following equation. So mechanical advantage, MA equals resistance divided by force, or mechanical advantage equals length of force arm divided by length of resistance arm. So again, here's, let's look at the first class lever. Produce balanced movements when the axis is midway between the force and the resistance. For example, seesaws. Your mechanical advantage is basically equal to 1. So here's force, here's resistance, okay, and here's the axis. So that's pretty much a first class lever. So when you have the test and I say, well, give me an example of a first class lever, then you're going to give me the seesaw as an example, as an everyday life example, and then I like a muscle. Now, scissors are also an example of a first class lever. So here's the axis, here's the force that you would apply, and then there's the resistance, depends on what you cut into. Now remember, they're not very efficient, so scissors, you know, sometimes you have to put a lot of effort into it. And depending on the seesaw, you know, if you have someone that weighs a lot more than you, then uh, obviously <laughs> it's not going to work. So you have to have a balance. So mechanical advantage is equal to one when there's a balance. Produce speed and range of motion when the axis is close to the force. For example, triceps and elbow extension. So the mechanical advantage is less than one. So triceps are an example of a first class lever. So there's your example of everyday life, scissors and seesaws, and Triceps are an example of a first-class lever. Okay, 
They produce speed and range of motion when the axis is close to the force. For example, triceps. So the mechanical advantage is less than one. Now, another first class lever produce force motion when the axis is closer to the resistance. For example, a crowbar. The mechanical advantage is greater than one. So you can produce force motion when the axis is closer to the resistance. So if you've ever used a crowbar, then you know that, hey, you have a mechanical advantage greater than one, so I can easily move this rock if I increase the lever here. So I have a greater advantage, mechanical advantage here. Okay. Now, agonist and antagonist muscle groups contract simultaneously on either side of the joint axis. Agonists produce the force, whereas the antagonist supplies the resistance. So here we go. Here's an example here. Here's the pivot point, which is the axis. Here's the resistance, the weight of the skull, and here's the force from the muscles. Now imagine if your resistance, if your head becomes forward, then you're going to put more force on the muscles and they can fatigue very quickly. And this is where you get headaches. So that's why if you can keep your head up in perfectly good alignment where the axis is perfectly in between the force and resistance, then you don't have a lot of strain on your neck. So see if you look at levers and pulleys, then they start to make sense. So again, if you look here, here's the axis, here's the force, and the weight of your skull, here's your resistance. So if you want that equal, try to have nice posture, ears over the shoulders right there. As soon as you come forward, the resistance becomes more, the force needed to maintain your neck it increases and then these muscles fatigue and then your neck starts to hurt. So if you were to take this example, right, of how this, the resistance increases and the added force increases, applied force, well then look at yourself texting all the time. So if you're nice and straight, right, at zero degrees, you only put about 10 to 12 pounds of torque on the neck, and which is normal, that's how much you're neck weighs, so that's fine. Just lean forward 15 degrees, now you put 27 pounds of torque. Lean even more, 30 degrees, and you put 40 pounds of torque. And here's where most of you are, 45 degrees to 60 degrees, you're putting almost 50 to 60 pounds of extra torque on all these upper traps, sternocleidomastoid, scalene, posterior, rhomboids, levator. No wonder your neck hurts, no wonder you have headaches. Okay, so now, Look at these biomechanical principles and understand why you have certain problems. And then when you look at certain postures, you'll be like, okay, I'm not at a mechanical advantage. It makes sense why I have low back pain. It makes sense why I have shoulder pain. Okay, so if you don't have the really good alignment, then your levers can't work as well. All right, <clears throat> so again, the triceps, overhead triceps extension applies the force to a lecranon and extending the non-supported forearm resistance at the elbow. So the access, the force, okay? And so that's overhead triceps extension. Force is applied where muscle inserts in the bone, not in the belly of the muscle. So example, in elbow extension, <clears throat> with the shoulder fully flexed and the arm Beside the ear, the tricep applies the force to the lecranon behind the axis of the elbow joint. All right, so think about you lying down and you're doing skull crushers, right? So that would be a good way to look at first class lever. You've heard of skull crushers. As the applied force exceeds the amount of forearm resistance, the elbow extends. Now, Placing the hand on the floor, as in performing a push-up to the body, okay, the same muscle action at this joint now changes the lever to a second-class lever because the access is at the hand and the resistance is the body weight at the elbow joint. So, can you do a push-up? How much weight can you do on a rope tricep extension? Okay, or, or a skull crusher. Okay. So those are some things that get, which one is more efficient, right? You can do a push-up, 
I mean, you weigh 100 pounds, 150 pounds, 200 pounds, but can you do 150 to 200 pounds of an overhead tricep extension? No way, right? So you can see how a second class lever is more efficient, right? You can lift a lot more weight. So doing push-ups, doing exercises that are more efficient, you're going to get more bang for the buck. So push-up is a great exercise, whereas an overhead tricep extension, skull crushers, Ah, they're great, but really your muscles are at a mechanical disadvantage. Okay. Now the second class lever, very, very efficient. So some uh, examples in real life would be a wheelbarrow. Here's the axis. Here's the resistance of the cement. There's a little force. He's happy because he doesn't have to put a lot of effort. A little nutcracker, right? Here's the resistance of the nut. Here's the force. Okay, and there's the axis. Same thing as this, very efficient, you can do some damage. And then same thing here, here's the access, here's the resistance, and there's the force. You ever had to change a flat tire besides calling AAA? You know how to use that. <laughs> okay, so mechanical advantage is greater than one. When your mechanical advantage is greater than one, then it's really uh, easy to do, perform the action. Now, plantar flexion of the foot to raise the body up on the toes right here here's the axis there's the resistance for your body whatever you weigh 150 200 pounds so the force has to be from the ga gastroc very efficient um, but there's relatively few second class levers in the body really the perfect example would just be the gastroc and the the soleus here so if you ask that on the quiz then you know that's a perfect example overhead triceps would be an example of a first class lever Okay. Example, plantar flexion of the foot, raise, so, okay, the foot surfaces of the axis, then I'm going to apply the force to the calcaneus. Now, a third class lever, produce speed and range of movements, most common in the human body. So third class, that's a great quiz question. That's the most common in the human body. You have resistance, force, and axes. So the axis, force, and resistance. So if you ever go rowing, here's Mr. Shark coming. Here's the axis, here's the force, and there's resistance. Rowing's tough, right? So it's not very efficient. You ever try to shovel? Again, there's the axis, there's the force, and there's the resistance. Shoveling's hard. So your mechanical advantage is less than one. So if, if you say that that's the most common in the human body, then it tells me that the human body is not very efficient, right? So it requires a great deal of force to move even a small resistance. So that's why going to the gym and working out, that's hard because you have to work a lot of force to move a small amount. Okay, so paddling a boat, shoveling, application of lifting force to shovel, handle with the lower hand while upper hand on the shovel serves as the axis of rotation. So here is third class lever. Here's the axis, the force, resistance, biceps brachii, here's the resistance, here's the axis. Using the elbow joint A as the axis, the biceps brachii applies force at its insertion on the radial tuberosity, the force, and to rotate the forearm with the center of gravity, the R is serving as the point of resistance, so that could be a weight, okay? So again, most common, not very efficient, so you have to lift a lot of weight to make those guns. So the gun show doesn't come easily, okay? Brachialis is your true third class leverage. Pulls on the uh, ulna just below the elbow. Okay. Pull is direct and true since the ulna cannot rotate. Biceps brachii supinates the forearm, applying the rotational force of a first class lever as in a wheel and axle to the races, as it flexes. So it's a third class lever applies to flexion only. So the biceps apply is a third class lever when it's just bending, but when it supinates, right, when you add that little extra twist, then it becomes a first class lever. So biceps can be a third and first class, still not efficient. Some other examples of third class levers are hamstrings. Hamstrings contracting to flex the leg at the knee in a standing in a standing position. There's a the joint. There's the hamstring. Now using the iliopsoas to flex the, the thigh at the hip, you'll try to cheat. If you're right, so you're trying trying to decrease the, uh, the 
the lever arm, and that's why you'll see a lot of people cheat with this, and they'll try to flex the hip here, okay? So you're trying to decrease this. But really, if you can do this, keep your knee straight and your hip straight, and then you're really getting your hamstrings. But you won't be able to lift a lot, because again, third class lever is not very efficient. Not very efficient at all. So the hamstrings work just like the biceps. But people will compensate, you know, that if you see people at the gym doing this, or if you see people uh, trying to do biceps, they'll swing their, their uh, body to increase their mechanical advantage, right? So when you see people compensate, they're trying to increase their mechanical advantage. So if we look at, again, at the torque and the length of lever arms in a first class lever, in figure A, right? If the force and arm and resistance arm are equal length, a force equal to the resistance is required to balance. So here's the axis, here's the force. It's pretty mechanical advantage is one, pretty efficient. So what you want to try to do when you're working out is try to have the axis of equal length. Okay. Now you can improve the mechanical advantage where the axis is closer to the resistance, even in a first class lever, and then your mechanical advantage becomes three. Okay. So again, we're dealt with, we can't change where our muscles insert. We can't change <laughs> our uh, levers in the body, but we can be more efficient and we can uh, have good posture. We can have good techniques. So that's the key is when you're working with the athlete or you're going to the gym, watching your posture, watching your technique to be efficient in your first, second, and third class levers. When you lean too far forward or when you lean back or when you lean to the side, you're decreasing the mechanical advantage and that's why squats can be more difficult for some people because either they're leaning too far forward or back or the weight is in the wrong place. Okay, so that's that's the whole point of showing you uh, first class, second class, and third class levers is, hey, we can't change where muscles insert. You know, if you had to do that, you would, you know, surgically you could remove it, uh, but that's ridiculous. But if you watch the technique and watch the axis and watch your posture, then you can be much more efficient. Again, second class levers, in figure A, balance the resistance halfway between the axis and the point of force up there provides a mechanical advantage of two. So here's the axis, here's the resistance, here's the force. If I put the resistance closer to the axes and increase my uh, arm here, then mechanical advantage becomes four. So if I had a wheelbarrow, right, and if I extended the arms even further, then I could lift four times as much versus if it was in the middle, okay? So looking at the mechanical advantages, again, third class levers, that's the most common in the body. So it's not very efficient. So look at, you never get a mechanical advantage of one. So, you know, biceps are unfortunately not very uh, efficient. Hamstrings are not very efficient. Um, but what can I do to increase it is have the force right in the middle of the resistance and the axes. Okay, so, but again, that's sometimes we can't change that because that's where the uh, biceps inserts. So what do we do, <laughs> right? So the only thing you can do is have a, a longer arm, right? Because if you have a longer arm, then you'll be able to be more efficient. But again, you're born with the size of your arms. So you can't change that. So again, looking at the first class lever, if you want to be efficient, you want to have the load, the fulcrum, and the efforts, the fulcrum closer to the load. For second class lever, you want the load closest to the fulcrum. And for the third class lever, you want the effort and the load furthest from the fulcrum. No, that's less efficient. If you have the effort closer to the fulcrum, you're more efficient here. So perfect example is let's look at the squat, a high bar versus a low bar squat, right? So if this is, you're obviously increasing the lever, this puts more stress on the hip, the back, and the knees. If you just bring the bar down in between your scapulas, a low bar, then you become much more efficient. So little simple techniques like that puts less strain on your hips, less strain on your back, so instead of doing a high bar squat, doing a low bar squat would be much more efficient. So, all right.